Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Nonprofits and Advocacy Webinar, The Rules of Advocacy as a Nonprofit Organization, brought to you by UCHAPS. Today's webinar, we have special guest speakers, uh, Devin Barrington Ward and also Drew Gibson. Um, after our webinar today at three o'clock, we will also continue our conversation on Facebook Live at 3 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. And our special guest will be Samantha Sarunik Dercher. I'll just give you some highlights about Samantha. She, is cur she currently serves as the Federal Policy Director of CECAS, and she leads the development and execution of CECAS's federal policy, education, advocacy, and lobbying strategies. So I'm gonna quickly go over some goals of our webinar today. Following our webinar, we envision participants being able to learn the rules of the do's and don'ts of advocacy as a nonprofit organization, identify ways to be a part of a movement without jeopardizing the organization's nonprofit status and understand the difference between advocacy and lobbying and learn how to avoid crossing the line. Now, I would like to introduce today's speakers. First is Drew Gibson. He is a policy associate with AIDS United, where he works with HIV service organizations and the people they serve to inform, educate, and affect positive change in Congress and at the federal government level. His, responsible, his responsibilities at AIDS United include the creation and oversight of their policy update, management of community mobilization efforts, and the coordination of the organization's election resource center. Drew also writes regularly about HIV and, and HIV related issues for the body. Our second speaker for today's webinar is Devin Barrington Ward. Devin Barrington Ward is a community activist and political strategist serving as the founder and managing director of the Social Justice League, a political consulting firm dedicated to using activism, advocacy, public policy, and media engagement to ensure the to secure the equity, freedom, and liberation of all Black people. Devin's work portfolio touches a range of racial equity and social justice issues with a particular focus on ending the HIV epidemic in Black communities in the South with his client, the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. Prior to full-time consulting, Devin started his career working to support Black leadership in Georgia by serving as a chief to staff to State Senator Lester Jackson and former State Representative Keisha Waits and campaign manager to former State Senator Ronald Ramsey. Devin is, has also served as a communications director to DC Council member Mary Che and Whitman Walker. I would like to begin our webinar and I'm going to uh, give control over to Drew Gibson. Drew, you, you have the controls. All right, thanks Martinez. Um, let's get started. It's titled Know the Rules, What HIV Service Organizations Can and Can't Do During an Election. Uh, let me see if I can get the, there we go. Um, oh, wow, that, there we are. Okay, um, so there are a bunch of things that you can do as a 501c3 um, during an election year. Um, and it's really a lot more than most organizations uh, think they can do. Um, let's see if I can get this back to the previous screen where it's supposed to be. There we are. Um, so one of the key things that you can do as a 501c3 is to help register people to vote at your agency. Um, this could be uh, whether it's helping individual clients, um, holding uh, meetings or get out the vote drives. Um, that is always 100% uh, uh, kosher if you're a 501c3. Um, it also enhances, uh, uh, expands from voter registration to voter education. So anything that you would be doing in the normal course of your work as an HIV uh, 501c3 um, is usually uh, permissible during an election. So if this involves educating uh, staff members, clients, board members, volunteers about the issues at stake at the upcoming election, um, you're usually good. Uh, a general rule of thumb is if you're focusing on issues specifically, uh, you should be fine. The more you start focusing on candidates is where things start to get iffy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can organize nonpartisan get out the vote drives and voter registration drives on uh, Age United's 
uh, Election Resource Center, we have a bunch of different um, resources that can help guide you from um, Alliance for Justice on how to you know, start a get out the vote drive um, and run one effectively. Um, it's also important to inform your community about um, the candidate stances on important issues like healthcare reform, housing, uh, funding HIV programs, and more. Uh, you can do this through uh, newsletters, you can do um, candidate questionnaires, um, which can be time consuming, but also very useful, uh, and examining the candidate's voting records. It's important to note that if you are examining a candidate's voting record, you cannot simply do it for a candidate for one party or the other. You have to, um, even if they don't have a explicit record on HIV related issues, you have to at least mention or cover it somewhat. Uh, we found that out during the 2016 president, presidential election. Um, uh, then candidate Clinton had a very extensive HIV record and now President Trump's record was non-existent. Um, but by the same token, we still had to um, sort of monitor and show our work for the fact that we actually looked for his record to begin with. Um, so as long as you're doing it for both sides, you're generally fine. Um, another way that you can um, do advocacy during an election year is by holding uh, town hall meetings or one-on-one -on -one meetings, one -on -one meetings with the candidates. Um, this is particularly useful when it comes to um, local candidates or smaller races that maybe your constituencies don't um, know about and who are candidates, they're probably more likely to um, be willing to interact and show up for a town hall meeting. Trying to get it to move one more. Don't know if, Martinez, can you move it one slide forward? It doesn't look like my, there we are. Um, other things you can do are fighting voter suppression through community education and monitoring of polling places and by providing transportation to the polls. Um, one of AIDS United's public policy council members, um, AIDS Alabama did a lot of of this in terms of uh, get out the vote work and providing transportation to the polls during the special election for Senator Doug Jones, and it made a tremendous impact. Um, simple things like this, if your organization has the capacity to do so, is extremely helpful um, and about as um, non controversial as you can get in terms of get out the vote efforts. Um, you can also use media to raise the visibility of HIV related issues through op eds, letters to the editor. Um, reaching out to reporters about candidate stances on HIV issues and how the outcomes of the elections could impact people living with and at risk of HIV. Um, it's important to note that if you do decide to go the media route, um, that you stay away from any sort of um, attacks on a candidate's past record um, or especially their, their personal lives or stances um, and try to stick mainly to the issues at hand. Um, so for instance, if you were writing an op-ed about the importance of maintaining and increasing Ryan White funding, that would be fine. But if you were an op-ed critiquing a sitting representative's votes um, against Ryan White or similar funding, that would uh, not be okay. Moving forward to the next one. All right, the don'ts and can'ts. Um, Number one, and one, two, and three, you can't endorse anybody, you cannot endorse a candidate, um, or tell people who and what to vote for. Um, that can be a bit of a blurry line um, in that you can um, sort of gently guide people <laughs> towards who, who or what they should vote for, basically by focusing on the issues that you think are the most important. And from there, um, hopefully, um, your, your clients or followers will be able to, to tell on their own which candidate is best for those issues. Um, but anything specifically calling out a candidate is uh, not allowed. You are not allowed to make any campaign contributions or have expenditures on behalf of any candidates. Um, and you're also not allowed to coordinate voter mobilization efforts uh, with a campaign. Um, so as long as you're doing sort of get out the vote stuff on your own or with other community organizations that aren't affiliated with a political party or a candidacy, you're fine. The moment you start working with a particular candidate is when you cross uh, that line into 501c4 territory. Um, you cannot lend support to a candidate political campaign on work time. 
Um, if you have employees that want to do so on their own uh, time, that is perfectly fine. Uh, but as long as they're on the clock with you, they cannot work with any candidate or campaign, and that includes um, ballot initiatives. Um, you cannot refuse to register a person based on their party affiliation um, or promote a candidate while at work with buttons, t-shirts, stickers, signs, or posters. Um, that one's a little nitpicky. Um, I mean, I, I don't think if anyone decided to wear a campaign button at work, the, um, the walls would come crashing down, but it's something to be, to be aware of. Um, also not allowed to provide free office space or contact lists to any candidates or campaigns. Um, and you can't ask candidates to sign pledges on any issue. Um, you, like I mentioned earlier in the do section, you can and are encouraged to uh, fill out uh, and submit questionnaires to candidates um, and to ask for their um, policy positions and plans um, should they be elected to office, um, but pledges um, are not allowed. Next slide. Okay, um, the AU Elections Resource Center. I'm designed to help members of the HB community navigate the 2018 midterm elections and become informed and active voters. Um, and also to assist aid service organizations and other 501c3s to mobilize people living with and affected by HIV to become engaged in the electoral process. Um, you can see the URL down below, www.hunited.org uh, backslash elections. Um, we have a lot of great content um, on there, but we're always looking to add more. Um, I don't know if my email is included at the end of this um, presentation or not, uh, but it, it's D Gibson G I B S O N at hunited.org. If you have any um, uh, election resources that are either local, uh, statewide, or federal that you think would be useful, by all means send it to me. We're always looking to include more things. Um, and AU is also developing a lot of original content, um, trying to get folks more familiar with various ballot races, important uh, congressional races. Um, and ways in which um, the HIV community can mobilize for the 2018 election. And I think that is about it from my end. Thank you so much, Drew. And I'm going to give controls over to Devin Barrington Ward. Devin? Devin, you're live now. Hello, Is, can folks hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Devin Barrington Ward. Um, and um, as Martinez mentioned via my bio, um, I, let's see if we can, is my camera working? No. Devin, we can see you. Okay, awesome. Um, and so I serve as um, a policy and advocacy consultant with the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, um, as well as some other organizations, including UCHAS. Um, and much of my work is around um, increasing the capacity of organizations to engage in advocacy, um, both electoral advocacy, but also um, um, advocacy within legislative institutions and building legislative power. And so this work um, and this presentation is a part of a larger portfolio of work that the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS has been funded to do via the Ford Foundation to increase the capacity of organizations to lobby black, uh, lobby and uh, engage in advocacy with black elected officials, um, and also increase the, uh, the capacity and knowledge of black elected officials of um, the HIV crisis that's taking place in many of their um, districts. Okay, I'm gonna to have to click on my screen because I'm using my iPad and my keyboard is not working. Um, and so as many of you all know, for those who are doing frontline work or much of the work that your organization does is frontline work um, or even you know, via health departments, uh, that ending the epidemic is gonna require more than condoms, preps 
and antiretrovirals. It is gonna require building the political will and pushing um, progressive uh, health-based policy that is encompassive of HIV and other um, disparities that impact um, the communities that we serve. And so the first thing is trying to understand the difference between advocacy and lobbying. Uh, lobbying is just one form of advocacy, but not all advocacy is lobbying, um, but all lobbying is advocacy. So a lot of times people use those words interchangeably, but there is a difference between lobbying and advocacy. Um, most nonprofits, uh, when they advocate, they advocate on their own um, behalf, uh, and they're seeking to um, change some aspect of society, whether that's to appeal to individuals' behaviors, um, for example, and that is a lot of the work that we do in the HIV space, is advocacy to, you know, um, increase health promotion. So to put on condoms, to take PrEP, to take your medication if you're a person who's living with HIV. And so that's a lot of the behavioral advocacy. Whereas lobbying refers to advocacy that is the specific attempt to influence legislation. Um, and what many of things, this is where the lines oftentimes get crossed is because a lot of folks are not familiar with what the difference between lobbying and advocacy is. And there is a misconception um, around whether or not nonprofits can actually engage in any lobbying um, or if their work specifically has to just be advocacy when it comes to speaking with elected officials. Okay, I'm having issues advancing to the next slide. Okay, so true or false, can nonprofits lobby? And it is fake news, nonprofits can lobby, but there are specific rules on how nonprofits can engage in lobbying. So as you can see here, there are rules that were set aside by Congress um, over the years that really defined um, what uh, are the requirements and limitations around nonprofits and their ability to lobby. Um, and as you can see here, the first statute recognizes the right of nonprofits to do some lobbying. However, they have set a limit that no substantial part of a organization's work that is a 501c3 can be lobbying. Um, in addition to that, uh, it allows nonprofits the option to elect to use um, you know, the, extent, the expenditure test. And then following that, there was another statute that really defined what that substantial part of those activities meant. So it meant that if a, for example, if a nonprofit um, uh, uh, was engaging in some sort of advocacy and lobbying, you can see here at the third statute that it's no more than 20% of the nonprofits forced $500,000 of expenditures. So uh, there is a, a considerable amount of um, limits in terms of uh, room that is given to nonprofits to engage in lobbying um, to meet the legal requirement. Um, in general, just as a general rule of thumb, um, no nonprofit may qualify for a 501c3 status if a substantial portion of their um, work is to influence legislation or to lobby. Um, and now the other thing to think about though is um, very specifically though, and a lot of times people get confused around, well, if I'm speaking to an elected official, is any conversation that I have with them a lobbying conversation or is it general advocacy? And so the next slide is gonna get into what uh, some of those things are. Uh, and so this is uh, a guide that I really think is helpful for organizations who are trying to figure out whether or not um, I can engage in lobbying. Um, and so here are some examples of activities that either fall under advocacy or fall under lobbying. Um, and so distributing materials to members of Congress or to your city council or school board members um, that discusses legislation but doesn't necessarily ask them, ask them to take any particular action. That is advocacy. Um, responding to a written request for technical advice from a legislative body. So let's say your local city council, um, we've been dealing with that in Metro Atlanta where the city council has been reached out to several organizations to get their opinion and advice on the HOPWA program, Housing Opportunities for People Living with HIV, which is a program they're responsible for administering. 
that's not lobbying when the elected officials reach out to you and ask you for your technical advice on a particular piece of legislation. Because one thing is important to remember is that most elected officials are not a subject matter expert on the things that we're coming to them and talking about. Um, advocating for the adoption or rejection of a particular piece of legislation, that is lobbying. Voter registration, as mentioned by Drew, is a form of advocacy, and that is not considered a form of lobbying, so you are in the clear to do voter registration. Um, there's something on my screen, so I can't really see the next um, point. Um, I believe it's urging the public to contact policymakers with the purpose of proposing um, or uh, adopting or opposing new legislation. Um, that is considered lobbying. Self-defense, um, that means this is legislation that would impact an organization's right to exist um, or their tax exemption status, um, and that is considered advocacy. So if there is a particular piece of legislation, right, but let's say it eliminates funding um, for a key part of, you, uh, of your agency's um, programming, that is considered, you are allowed to reach out to your base of support, your clients, your volunteers, and ask them to reach out to any particular elected officials and ask them to consider to vote against a particular manner because uh, matter because that is considered self-defense. And so if it threatens your organization's right to exist or ability to exist, it's considered advocacy and you're in the clear for that. Um, offering your opinion or educating legislators without mentioning legislation that is advocacy and litigation on a particular issue is also considered advocacy. And so one of the things that's really important, um, and we're not gonna uh, uh, do it obviously via the webinar, um, but a video that I encourage people to watch a lot is the uh, Schoolhouse Rocks, how a, a piece of legislation becomes a law. Um, you know, it's uh, very surprising, but you'll be uh, surprised by how many people are not familiar with the legislative process and the nuances that come along with that. And I think before you really have a baseline understanding of what advocacy is and what lobbying is, it's really important to understand the legislative process and that those processes may be different at the federal level versus the state level versus the local level. And understanding those nuances is also an essential part in keeping you out of the clear. The most important thing to remember is, is that in general, I encourage most ad, uh, nonprofits to engage in general advocacy. General advocacy is just educating lawmakers around the HIV epidemic, around policies that can help improve the HIV epidemic, um, and advocating around particular policies is not necessarily lobbying. But at the point where you talk any, mention any specific piece of legislation, you are lobbying, which doesn't mean that you aren't allowed to engage in it at all. You just need to make sure that you're meeting the thresholds and the requirements and the limitations that are placed on nonprofits as far as lobbying is concerned. And I believe, last quote, um, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And so that's why I do think that it's important, again, engage in general advocacy. All HIV organizations should be engaging in legislative advocacy. But there will be times where we will have to engage in some specific lobbying because of things that may be happening within your respective communities. And don't be afraid to engage in that. Just, again, um, make sure that you're in the clear. Make sure that you're meeting the requirements that have been set out by law. Um, as far as what limitations are concerned around nonprofits and their lobbying, um, and ask questions. And there's my email. You, my uh, Amblocka email is there, as well as my personal email address. Martinez, back to you. Thank you so much, Devin and Drew, for your amazing presentations and your contributions to educating our, us on nonprofits and advocacy, the do's and don'ts of advocacy as a nonprofit organization. 
Um, I just wanted to open now, I'll open our session now to some of our participants for questions and answers. Uh, if you want to submit a question, you can go ahead and uh, submit a question through the chat box located um, in, your, uh, in your menu. If you select chat, just go ahead and type in your question and we will have Drew and, and, uh, and Devin answer your questions. No questions, anyone? Okay. Well, I had a, a question uh, for both of you, uh, Drew and Devin. I uh, wanted to see what, what other additional information would you pass on to any type of community-based organizations uh, who are planning, um, for instance, their, uh, their voter registration? What, what, if they're doing voter registration, what are some things, I mean, we all know that that's advocacy and they're allowed to do that, but while they're doing that, what, what should they avoid doing? Um, Drew, would you like me to start? I'll assume that's yes. Um, as far as, um, uh, I see a, a message from Drew, he's asking to be unmuted. Um, as far as uh, voter registration, some things to avoid, again, some of the things that Drew mentioned um, around uh, making sure that you aren't endorsing a candidate, right? Um, now, here's the thing. Remember that as a citizen, you still have your own voice, you own your voice, and you have the ability to endorse whoever you want as a citizen. However, I cannot, for example, on behalf of Mblaka, make an endorsement of a particular candidate um, uh, who is running for office. So that's one important thing to remember. I think the other important thing to remember around uh, things to avoid or things that you should be doing is, um, I think oftentimes we are really good around registering people to vote, but we aren't really good around um, reminding people the importance of voting. Um, and that uh, you know, there's a separate uh, uh, there's a separate from getting someone registered to vote versus having them actually come out to the polls. And so, um, you know, voter registration is like 50% of the work. The other 50% of the work is really encouraging them to get out to the polls. The last thing that I would say is, as Drew mentioned, the candidate questionnaires can be kind of labor intensive labor intensive, but for nonprofits, particularly community-based organizations, the best form of advocacy um, and uh, voter engagement is done when you're working in coalition with other CBOs and ASOs in your particular cities. So that way the workload doesn't fall on one particular organization. And so if a group of organizations, for example, come together and put together a candidate questionnaire, you're now registering people to vote, but at the same time when they're being registered, they're also receiving information around the elections that are coming up and how the particular key races in their cities and in their jurisdictions and communities, how the candidates um, in those key races um, feel about issues that are important to your organization and to people who are living with HIV. Um, absolutely, I definitely second uh, everything Devin just said, uh, especially um, with regards to the importance of following through with voters. Um, voter registration is extremely important, um, but the amount of new voters that you'll get each year is usually um, much smaller than the amount of voters who are already registered, but who for one reason or another can't make it or won't make it to the polls. Um, so if you have the bandwidth to do it, finding ways to engage with, if you're an ASO, uh, to engage with your clients and um, try and find ways to get them to the polls, see what their needs are, if it's transportation, if it's getting off work, um, whatever it is, if it's knowledge of where the polling places are, um, working to make sure that they have all the tools they need to get to the polls um, is really important work that I, I can't stress enough um, ASLs can and, and should uh, be doing in the weeks and months leading up to an election. Um, and also building off of the candidate questionnaire piece, um, one way, not necessarily around um, the uh, the bars on reaching out to one party or rather than the other, is um, by reaching out to folks who um, 
might not necessarily show up from one party, but they might for the other. Um, so as long as you ask, say, the attorney general candidates for both Democrats, Republicans, and maybe a third party like the Libertarians, if you ask all two or three of them to come and only one of them says yes, you've done your part. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of ways you can introduce people to uh, different views, and it's wonderful to have um, multiple party representation, um, but it's not necessary to have these sorts of town halls uh, or to fill out these questionnaires. So as long as you put in the effort to reaching out towards everyone, uh, your 501c3 should be fine. Thank you both for answering that question. Uh, I have another question from a participant. What are different types of nonprofit certifications that would allow organizations to effectively advocate or lobby? Um, this, is a, this is not really my uh, area of expertise. Maybe Devin can speak to it more, uh, but it sounds like sort of what we're talking about is the difference between 501c3s and 501c4s. Um, and the capacity of your organization to uh, be an sort of a political entity or whether you're strictly a nonprofit. Um, Devin, do you have any? Looks like Devin's muted. Um, Martin has, so if we could get him unmuted. <laughs> We had him for about half a second. Uh, so yes, uh, there are different certifications um, or filing statuses. So the 501c3 filing status is the one that most people on this webinar would be familiar with. The difference between 501c3 and 501c4 is that donations to a 501c4 are not tax deductible. Um, and basically, um, you know, it's the opinion of um, the government that if you're receiving donations to lobby the government or to influence things politically that those donations should not be um, that the bulk of those donations should not be tax deductible. Again, there are some now not every nonprofit that wants to lobby or needs to lobby needs to be a 501c4. It again depends on the level of lobbying that you're doing. So let's say for argument's sake, you are a nonprofit that has a half a million dollar budget, right? So the 20% of your half a million dollar budget cannot, uh, you, you're only allowed about 20% of your half, half a million dollar budget to engage in heavy lobbying, which is around specific legislation, right? And so a couple of things, not all lobbying requires expenditures, right? So I'm a registered lobbyist in Georgia. Uh, the clients that I lobby for are nonprofits um, and I lobby for them during the legislative session. So between my cost that's associated with being their lobbyist, but the fact that I don't really take any people out for dinners, I don't really uh, take any elected officials out for dinners, I don't really spend any money in terms of engaging in that level of lobbying. And so when I do my lobbyist um, expenditure forms on behalf of the organizations that I lobby for, they're a easily able to show that I have not hit whatever limitation uh, in terms of the dollar amount that's given based on their budget as far as what they're allowed to engage in lobbying for. So one, ask yourself, are you going to exceed whatever that 20% threshold is in terms of how much you're allowed to lobby? That's one question you need to ask yourself. The other thing that you should be asking yourself is around capacity. Um, an organization that I um, am a member of, Black Youth Project 100, which is a 501c3, but we've recently uh, started a sister 501c4 um, that's under the same name, Black Youth Project 100, but that allows us to engage in more heavy lobbying and also as an organization we are able to endorse. The last structure that I would make mention of is there's nothing stopping a, a, a group of individuals who work in the HIV space, but outside of their work want to work in coalition together to influence the political process. And this is called a political action committee, a PAC. There are two forms of PACs. There are regular political action committees and there are super PACs. Um, the biggest distinction between a PAC and a super PAC is that super PACs are not allowed to coordinate resources with the candidate. They can just speak up on the candidate on their behalf, but they can no be a fit, there can be no official communication between a super PAC and a candidate that is running for office.
office that the super PAC may be supporting. Whereas a political action committee can coordinate resources and can be in regular contact with a candidate. Again, no nonprofit is gonna be able to start their own political action committee, that's not allowed. As a nonprofit, you are allowed to start a 501c4. However, if you would like to take, your, take this work outside of your organization and engage in some more heavy hand-to-hand -hand political combat, I would encourage people to find other like-minded individuals who want to do this outside of their um, nine to five hours. I know many of you all are probably working more than nine to five, but outside of your work hours to work together in coalition as a political action committee, and that allows you to endorse it also allows you to lobby and engage in some more heavy political activities um, if that is what you desire to do. And just to uh, build on what Devin was saying, um, in terms of that 20% mark um, that 501c3s can reach in terms of lobbying, um, if you're at all worried about surpassing that, there are lots of pretty uh, easy solutions in terms of how you frame your issues to whether it's uh, members of Congress or state legislators, um, so that you're not uh, talking about a specific piece of legislation or a budgetary ask, but about the issue itself. Um, so for instance, say if you're working with like age education training centers, um, if you went to see a member of Congress and you said, we want X amount of dollars or X percent increase in the next uh, fiscal year's budget, that would be lobbying. If, however, you went and talked about the work that you did at your age education training centers and the importance of that work, with the implication being that we need you to keep on supporting this, that is advocacy. So um, there's there are easy ways that you can get around that three percent mark. And for the most part, if you're a five hundred one c three who doesn't have um, dedicated staff to lobbying, you're probably right. not going to be close to reaching that. There, there's really very little reason to worry unless lobbying is a a very large chunk of what you do. Um, at Age United, we are a 501c3. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the Hill, um, and we are never close to hitting that 20% mark. So um, something you should be same aware of with, or not worry about. Same thing with all of the clients that I've worked for, um, that I've done lobby for, where they've hired me to be their lobbyist or their political um, consultant or legislative strategist. None of them ever come close to the 20% threshold because most of the time, um, I'm, you know, I would call it code switching for, uh, for a lack of a better word, um, is framing whatever their particular issue is and how do I make it general unless it requires that I get very specific. So for example, if there is a piece of legislation that is going to completely eliminate you know, what, um, you know, a key source of funding that is, you know, really important for this organization's ability to provide care for its clients, then that might be an opportunity where you want to get very specific and talk about a specific piece of legislation and lobby. But again, um, as Drew mentioned, um, if you don't have dedicated policy staff, dedicated advocacy staff, the likelihood of you all hitting that threshold or getting anywhere close to that threshold is, is very small. Um, and it looks like um, Martin Dez was hoping that I'd address um, sort of how HIV AIDS organizations can uh, more successfully uh, or improve their, their HIV advocacy policies and how they approach um, that work. Uh, the, the biggest piece of advice I would give um, would be to make things personal and make things local. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, especially on Capitol Hill, if you come to an office and you don't have an established relationship with an office um, and you're not their constituent, they have already tuned out by the time you get to the door. Um, they want to hear about the voters that they're responsible to and who can keep them in or out of office. Um, and if you're not one of them, uh, you have to do a lot of work to actually get their ear. So focusing on folks that um, directly represent you and your clients is very important. And also making sure to get like a personal connection with the legislator. Uh, invite them for a tour of your facility, uh, invite them to events that you're hosting, um, anything you can do to build a rapport with them and more importantly with their staffers who you'll be dealing with 99% of the time. Um, David, do you have something you want to say? Yes, um, one of the most uh, important things to remember is actually know who represents you. 
um, lines, uh, congressional maps, um, legislative maps are, are redrawn every 10 years. And so you may be thinking that because you've seen this person's yard sign that they um, are the person who represents you, but they may not. And so some specific resources for that is Project Vote Smart. Um, votesmart.org, you can put in your address and your zip code and it will bring up all of the federal and um, state elected officials who represent you. Um, and if you want to specifically look for your state um, uh, senator or state representative or delegate or assembly person, openstate.org is another good resource um, and they'll bring up specifically who represents you at the state level in your legislature. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I do these types of trainings um, and usually my trainings are about um, sometimes they can be a half a day, they can be a whole weekend. Um, because this uh, work is very in-depth and very layered. Um, how we hit a major roadblock when people can't tell me who it is that represents them at the respective levels of government. Um, all levels of, of government have a role to play in ending the epidemic. And so before I encourage you, before you come to Washington, D.C., although AIDS Watch is really important, I would challenge you if you have not invited a local elected official to tour your facility, if you have not gone and had a meeting with a local elected official, either at the state or county or city level about the work that you all are doing, I would challenge you to really do that before you start looking at the federal advocacy work, because there are so many issues as pertains to HIV and other sexual health disparities that can be changed at the state and local level that are low hanging fruit that oftentimes those elected officials never see HIV activists in their offices. Thank you both for answering that really um, question, that, that question in, in depth. I have another question from a participant. Uh, it's taking the 501H election, which allows nonprofits to elect to be measured by the objective expenditure test, do you recommend this or not for 501c3s who want to be more explicit in their lobbying? What are the pros and cons? Um, so I think that um, a couple of things. Um, I, if you are going to engage in that type of lobbying and you don't want to get a 501c4, then yes, I would make, I would just to make sure that you're in the clear, follow the expenditure test. Um, but I would encourage you that if, um, and this is, and it is necessary, we do need more uh, uh, organizations like Age United represented at the state and local level, because the work that Age United does is really amazing federally, um, and they do support some state and local efforts, but by and large, there aren't really a lot of state versions of an Age United or regional versions of an Age United or some of the other um, we have representing us nationally that have a focus on policy and advocacy. And so if you are going to engage in a, in a significant amount of lobbying, I would, um, in the short term, I would adhere to the expenditure check test, but in the long term, you may want to be looking at some more sustainable structures for engaging in that type of lobbying and advocacy. Some folks will talk organizations back away from, from engaging in heavy lobbying and advocacy, but I think particularly for organizations that are in the South, where you have um, you know, policies like you know, the lack of Medicaid expansion, the lack of comprehensive sexual, uh, sexual health education in public schools, the lack of um, uh, comprehensive civil rights legislation that includes LGBTQ people, um, HIV criminalization, and a whole litany of other policy challenges and legislative and, and, and legislative challenges that do not create an environment where you can really end the epidemic. Um, I understand why some organizations and encourage some organizations to look at carving out um, some very specific um, policy struck policy and lobbying structures to advance the work of their organization um, and uh, the movement. Yeah, I would say at least um, in, in terms of the 501H election, it's basically an insurance policy. Um, it's, it's a way for folks to um, sort of get a little peace of mind and be able to see exactly how much they're allowed to use for lobbying. 
Um, and again, that, that 20% mark, um, if you're not, if you don't think you're coming close to it, I wouldn't worry about the 501H election. Uh, it's just a little more work that, um, that you wouldn't need to do. But if you are worried about um, exceeding that threshold um, and you haven't started a 501C4 and don't have plans to, I think the 501H is very useful. Thank you both for that very great information that you just shared for that question. Um, does, does anyone else have any, any more questions? Um, I have one or I have two more. I have another question that wants to address uh, more information about uh, 501H. Would any one of you like to uh, address that? Uh, what was the question? Uh, tell us more about 501H. Uh, I, I don't think it was uh, touched on uh, a lot in the presentation, but what is, what is, it, what is a 501H? So I'm familiar with 501C3 and 501C4. 501, 501H, um, I think, just specifically talks about the expenditure test. Yeah, the, um, the 501H isn't um, so much a designation in the same way that a 501C3 or 501C4 is. It's, it's more a sort of tax tool through which you can um, cover all your bases and, and make sure that you're following uh, the election law. There are some, um, once you go above the $500,000 mark um, in terms of expenditures, there is uh, like a tiered um, structure to how what percentage of that you're allowed to use that I'm not entirely familiar with. Um, but the uh, Alliance for Justice and Boulder Advocacy have a lot of great resources um, out there on it. So they would probably be able to uh, explain it better than I would. Yeah. Yeah, but just for all intents and purposes, it's not a separate designation. It's really just um, a tool, as, as Drew mentioned, to make sure that you're in the clear. Um, but here's the other thing. Very rarely do you hear about a nonprofit that has lost their nonprofit status from engaging in some form of lobbying. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, it's one, it's also very complicated for uh, the IRS to audit something like that. Um, and, and so again, unless you are engaging in a high level of lobbying, right? Um, and you really have to ask yourself, examine each policy issue that's happening in your community and categorize it. Does this mean, because some things may not even have a specific piece of legislation to lobby around, right? So you're asking your, one, you have to ask yourself, is this a policy issue, right? This is a policy and advocacy issue. Um, does it need to bump up to the level where it requires specific lobbying? Or can we generally talk about how we support these types of policies and the need to, you know, support PrEP access, the need to support Ryan White, you know, things of that nature. Those are general advocacy touch points. But if there's something very specific in your community that may require lobbying, but again, um, unless you are spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on that level of lobbying, you probably are not going to hit that, uh, that threshold um, as far as the limitations are concerned. Yeah, um, just by way of example, um, in terms of HIV criminalization, um, right now there is with what, four months, five months left in this 115th Congress, there is virtually no chance that the uh, Repeal Act, which is the main um, HIV criminalization law uh, currently uh, in, in, in Congress is going anywhere this year. Um, so if you wanted to talk about HIV criminalization, there's no need to mention a specific piece of legislation. You can talk about the ways it's impacting your community, the reasons why HIV criminalization laws are harmful, um, and it doesn't touch um, anything that would be considered lobbying. Um, however, if you're dealing with a specific piece of legislation that you really want to push, that's when you would want to go to lobbying, or if you have a very specific um, funding ask, that's when you can cross that threshold. But for the most part, you can talk about uh, the issues that matter to you, to your organization, and to the people you serve without discussing things that would bring it to the level of lobbying. So an example of what would require lobbying, right? So Drew, that was a great example of something that doesn't necessarily require for you to get as specific as lobbying. 
But in Georgia, for example, um, at the state level, we were working in the General Assembly. Um, and there, because of the opioid epidemic and the connection between opioids, injection drug users, and HIV, there were several counties on the list in Georgia that were a part of the CDC and AMFAR's list of counties that were susceptible to an Indiana-like HIV outbreak um, due to their high uh, use of injection drugs, the HIV epidemic in the area, and the resources that exist to support HIV prevention and treatment efforts. And so many of those counties were rural counties that were represented by more Republicans. And so there was an opportunity between Republicans and Democrats to come up with a bipartisan piece of legislation to start a, prep, a piloted statewide PrEP drug assistance program. There was an actually an opportunity. There were the votes there for it. The committee chairperson was supportive of it. And so that was an opportunity where we said, yes, we need to specifically lobby because there's a chance that this could happen. But if it was, for example, HIV criminalization in Georgia, we know right now there just isn't the palette or the um, political will amongst Democrats or Republicans um, to move that piece of legislation. So there's no need to talk about it specifically. We just talk about HIV criminalization generally being bad. And thank you so much for answering uh, that question. I just wanted to uh, give some reminders uh, for everyone who's participating today on the webinar to complete the webinar survey. Uh, it is in the chat box. Uh, you will have a direct link to that. So please take some time to complete that for us. Also, I just wanted to share, I'm sorry, one second. share some information about today's uh, post-webinar conversation uh, that will happen at three o'clock today on Facebook Live. Um, Samantha Cyrillic Dercher, who currently serves as the SECAS Federal Policy Director, will be with us to answer even more questions and address more issues related to advocacy and nonprofit organizations. Uh, she um, definitely, she serves as the federal policymaker of uh, she, she serves as in the development and execution of CECAS's federal policy, education, advocacy, and lobbying strategies. So be sure to join us at three o'clock on Facebook Live. Uh, you can go live with us by following you chaps on facebook.com. Also, if there are any webinars that you have missed, uh, UCHAPS webinars you've missed, we have a library of archived webinars that you can access on UCHAPS.org by going to the UCHAPS Resource Center. Um, and also, um, you can check out some more um, uh, events on, on uchaps.org. So for our future events, you can go to uchaps.org slash events. Um, and also, I will re-email the, the survey to everyone who have registered for this webinar. So if you've missed the chat uh, link, I will make sure that you all get that information via email. And that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Devin Barrington Ward and Drew Gibson for, you know, giving us some awesome information today. And I wanted to thank everyone for participating and logging on um, to our webinar, Nonprofits in Oregon, in, in Oregon and, I'm sorry, Nonprofits and um, Advocacy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.